300 blackout. Yay, boo, yeah, settle down, children, you're both right. This is the AR build that I've been using as a test bed for the 300 blackout cartridge, as well as a host for a variety of optics that were 300 blackout adjacent that I wanted to review. Today, we're gonna talk about how this thing is put together and the parts choices, why I built it that way, and then what I would like to change about it if I was going to rebuild it or replace it with some other 300 blackout gun. Let's go for it. The attribute of 300 blackout that most interests me is the performance of supersonic ammunition from short barrels. I know it's popular to say that there's no point to 300 blackout if you aren't shooting suppressed or you aren't shooting subsonic, but that's kind of silly and I regret even paying the idea lip service. If we want to dip our toes into the nut and fancy POU discussion, the reason I want 300 blackout in the inventory is for use as a brush gun, a very short overall package that is maneuverable in the dense woods, even with a suppressor. We can get a more compact package than any reasonable configuration of 5.56 AR, but without losing too much velocity. Light for caliber 300 blackout supers are still way heavier than heavy for caliber 5.56, and heavier bullets deflect less when going through brush. So, with that POU in mind, let's talk about the build specifics. This gun actually started life as a shorty 5.56 build with a 7.5 inch barrel, which was a ridiculous gun, totally just a gimmick, but with a blast forwarding device or, you know, flash can on the end, it would toss out massive fireballs, which was very cool. But at some point, obviously it made more sense to rebarrel this thing to 300 blackout. So originally I rebarreled it with a 7.5 inch Faxon 300 blackout barrel, but I actually re-rebarreled it to an 8 inch uh, ballistic advantage 300 blackout barrel. This is just built off of a regular, albeit very beleaguered, Anderson upper and lower combination. Uh, at least I think they're both Anderson. Um, both the upper and lower are Cerro Forge marked, so pretty sure it's just an old Anderson set that I have been using since that original build. Uh, this has had multiple sets of lower parts kits. This used to have a Strike Industries lower parts kit, but it actually kind of wore out in surprisingly short order. So uh, sometime between when it was painted and now, I've replaced most of the lower parts with a fresh set from CMMG, which are just better quality parts, and that's why they're black instead of green. Uh, same thing, replaced the dust cover with a Magpul dust cover, just because I wanted to try out the Magpul dust cover. And they look cool, and also all the furniture color matches Hey, that's pretty sweet, right? So the reason I actually rebarreled it from a seven and a half inch Faxon into an eight inch ballistic advantage is because uh, when I ordered my YHM Resonator K, I was under the belief that the minimum barrel length for 300 blackout supersonic ammunition with that can was eight inches. I think depending on where you check, like if you look on their website versus if you look on Silencer Shop, I think you'll get two different numbers. So either seven and a half inches or eight inches minimum barrel length for supersonic. Not 100% sure what the official number is. The same thing is true of the YHM R9, which is on there right now. Uh, the other issue is that with a seven and a half inch barrel and uh, standard muzzle devices, there was really very little clearance on this seven inch handguard. So eight inch barrel pushes it just a little bit farther forward. It's easier to get on there, easier to work with. So this is an eight inch barrel with a pistol length gas system and it's just a fixed low profile gas block, not adjustable. I've still never been a fan of adjustable gas blocks. The handguard is a UTG Pro super slim seven inch rail. This has got their you know proprietary screw on rail sections instead of M being M lock or key mod or Picatinny or anything like that. Uh, this rail section underneath here is actually just used as like, a, like an indexing point or a finger stop. These rails are actually really cool, although they're super old school at this point. They've been on the market for a really long time. I think there are, are better options that fall in the same approximate price category. Back when these were you know, newer, they were one of the best, cheapest rails you can get. There's actually a super clever friction fit system under here. There is a steel barrel nut, and there's a steel collar that goes inside the barrel nut. And then these screws go through the handguard and actually into the steel collar, pulling it out against the steel barrel nut. So you've got a pretty even distribution of friction. You can also put quite a lot of torque onto it because you've got steel hardware going into a steel sleeve pulling against a steel barrel nut. So the fact that the handguard itself is aluminum, not really an issue because the handguard is really not doing any of the, uh, the flexing or the torque. So these rails are severely underrated, although of course nobody really wants them now because you have to attach their proprietary screw on rail sections and then attach your accessories to the rail sections. So yeah, it's not a very elegant way to set up a gun. 
There is a standard spring in the buffer system and an H2 buffer. This thing seems to work pretty well with supers and subsonic ammunition. It's a little bit undergassed with subsonic and a suppressor on it, and it's a little bit overgassed with supers and a suppressor on it. So we're kind of splitting that difference. This thing will run supers unsuppressed, supers and subs suppressed. Reliability with subs unsuppressed is a little bit hit or miss. Um, biggest issue is just that it doesn't always lock open on empty, but it actually does cycle reasonably well. Muzzle device is a Yankee Hill 5.8x24 Flash Hider uh, Phantom Mini. So this is the shorter version of the Phantom Flash Hider mount. And it'll QD with various suppressors that are using that system. I used to use it obviously with the Resonator K. Now I'm using it with the YHM R9, which seems to be just a little, little quieter or just a little more pleasant in tone versus the Resonator K. Also, this frees up the Resonator K to go on, you know, 308s. The light and laser module is my original Phantom Hill CTF-1. This allows it to have a white light and an IR light and an IR laser all integrated into the same unit. I talked about this unit quite a lot in the past. It's uh, a very cool little unit for its size and weight and cost. Not a super high performance device, but that's okay, because this is obviously not a weapon designed to engage at long range. So the fact that we have a short range white light illuminator and a short range infrared illuminator not really an issue. Bolt carrier group is, again, one of my very oldest bolt carrier groups that has been reconditioned with new gas rings maybe once or twice. Uh, I don't know what brand this is. It might have been Anderson. If I remember correctly, it was an Anderson bolt carrier group that cost me $48 on sale, and it has a skull laser engraved into the side of it, and the uh, the gas ports, the, uh, <laughs> the gas vents on the side of the BCG are lined up with the skull's eyes. So, very cool. Definitely a relic of gun culture 3.0 or 2.0, or whatever we decided to call that one with the uh, the zombie craze. As far as the other furniture goes, we've got a Magpul enhanced trigger guard, Magpul K2 grip. This does have the storage core for a pair of CR-123 batteries in there. Those go with the Phantom Hill CTF-1 uh, because that thing tends to launch on batteries. It does have, I think, a bit of a parasitic drain problem, which not too surprising to me because it's always on standby. It's not like a laser you can actually turn fully off. It's always on standby waiting for input from the switches. So I think that's why it tends to drain itself a little bit over time. The sling is a Ed Sherman Designs sling. This is a super simple two point quick adjust sling. Uh, it works the same as every other two point quick adjust sling and I like it just as much as all the other ones. The attachment for this is a little bit interesting. Uh, KAK Industry actually makes a sling QD swivel mount that attaches directly to the proprietary screw holes on the UTG Pro uh, Super Slim handguards. So quite a lot nicer than trying to either like fish some other kind of sling mount through there or mounting a, a pick rail section and then a pick rail sling mount because pick rail sling mounts tend to kind of suck. Charging handle is a BCM Gunfighter. I think it's the Mod 4B. Something like that. Uh, it's non-ambidextrous. It has the relatively low profile latches which I greatly prefer. Anything that you intend to use in conjunction with kit probably should have the low profile latches. Otherwise, it's going to uh, pull itself out of battery as it jostles up and down on your, on your web gear. The optic on there right now is a Holosun HS510C with the lower third spacer on it. Uh, this optic is not something I would really recommend, mostly because it's kind of overpriced compared to other better stuff that you can get now. Also, if you want it to sit at lower one third, which makes it a lot more usable, more comfortable, then you have to buy the little spacer thing separately. It doesn't come with it. This thing also has a pretty chintzy mount. Also, it's open emitter. This is just on there as a placeholder because unfortunately the optic that I wanted to have on here died. This gun had a parade of optics on it, some better than others. The Primary Arms GLX 2X Prism was probably the best fit. They are light, compact, robust, with just a bit of usable magnification and a reticle that allows you to compensate for the ludicrous drop of 300 blackout subsonic ammunition. A red dot with or without a magnifier would also work. The optic I want to put on here is a lightweight 1-4 LPVO. I actually managed to get my hands on a rare capped turret version of the Vortex Viper PST 1-4, but then I took it outside when it was cold, and all the nitrogen fell out, and Vortex couldn't fix it, so they replaced it with a different scope. I took a chance and got a Trigicon AccuPoint 1-4 because it seemed like a great fit. Unfortunately, it has the same appallingly bad glass quality as the Credo 1-4. 
There are plenty of other good LPVOs out there, but most of them aren't as lightweight as this. The total package, including the mount, comes in at well under 20 ounces. If I was going to re-barrel this gun or redo this same build, I would probably just go with a 9-inch barrel. That's a pretty well-established sweet spot of performance for 300 Blackout. An extra inch isn't going to hurt, wink, and neither is a bit of extra velocity and slightly less noise with subsonics. Regardless of how we set up our 300 Blackout gun, we have the option of using it like the Brass Fax 300 Blackout Sentry Gun POU. Starter mag of subs, followed by a combat load of supers. That's more of a doctrinal thing that can be applied to any gun in this caliber. A 9-inch barrel paired with one of the optics options we discussed is a pretty versatile configuration overall. A PDW build would have to be way shorter and probably incorporate a folding stock, i.e. the CMMG Descent. We could also go ever so slightly longer and configure a 300 Blackout like any other shorty tactical carbine. 300 Blackout as a replacement for a Mark 18 or a replacement for a short AK, that's something we might have to revisit later on. That's all for now, guys. Thank you for watching. I know this video is kind of nonsense, but I did promise I was going to go over the configuration of this gun, so here we go. I did. Happy now, Carl? If you like this channel and you want to support me, you can. It's a free country. Go ahead. Figure it out. See you later.